Okay. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Mark Hauswald. I'm a professor of emergency medicine at the University of New Mexico. But I was smart enough to retire from my previous job. I was the clinical director for the medical school. So I did all of the financial stuff. I did all of the medical legal stuff. Um, I was the consummate bureau bureaucratic geek for the medical school. And I retired about five, six years ago. I now run their global health programs quarter time. I work part time for IHS. I have a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates to do research in Nepal. Um, I do, I've totally failed retirement. <laughs> But my interest, my interest in medical economics is pretty deep because, first of all, in my old job, I had to know that stuff. And because it's actually fairly interesting. And in the U.S., it's particularly interesting because we have the most screwed up economic system going. So this will hopefully not offend everybody or anybody, but the reality is almost everybody out there has the wrong idea of what this policy really does. It's actually not very complicated. So here's a current system, and it is very com complicated. We have the largest socialized health care system, the largest national health care system in the world in financial terms. Half of all U.S. health care dollars goes to Medicare and Medicaid. Most of it goes to Medicare, uh, covers about, you see the numbers, covers about 40 million elderly. I'm, getting very close to that 65, so maybe it's not that elderly. And about 10 million people who are permanently disabled, most of that disability is blind, um, missing extremities, severely retarded. We're not talking about minor stuff here. Then there's a Medicaid program in CHIPS, which is a carve-out for pediatrics. There's about 40 million extra enrollees in that. Some people have both. Some elderly people have Medicare and Medicaid because they're under the financial level for Medicaid. So those are the numbers there. It's about 31 million of those 40 are children. Um, then there's a lot of overlap. These numbers do not add up to 40 million. And the reason for that is because lots of people fit into more than one category. And the amounts are huge. So of the 90 million-ish people covered by Medicare Medicaid, we're looking at about $860 billion a year. <clears throat> One of the things that's interesting about Medicare Medicaid from a physician standpoint is it is not designed to pay the cost of care. It's designed to pay the marginal cost of care. And it is essentially impossible for a physician or a hospital to break even if this is all they collect. It's designed that way. And then we have a socialized system. We actually have a fairly large socialized system. There are about 1.8 million uh, Native Americans in IHS. That's about 4.3 billion, which is where I'm currently working part-time. There's another almost 10 million people in the military. It, the 50 billion is actually an understatement because an, a uniformed physician working in a military hospital is not counted in this. So a lot of the salaries aren't there. The money's actually a little bit greater than that. And then the VA covers about 5.5 million people. There are about 24 million eligible people, but you don't go to the VA if you have insurance. So that's another 50 billion odd dollars. <clears throat> So put all those together, and you've got about 100 million Americans. The Affordable Care Act would add about 15 million to Medicaid. So that's a, about a 15% increase in the total. The rules are um, the income, your income is up to 133% of poverty would make you eligible for Medicaid. And that's about 14, 15,000 a year for one person. It's currently 11,000. That second number in brackets is what it takes to get you. It's, it's, that's what it would take you to get on now. That's annual income. Annual per income per, for one person. For a family of four, you're eligible for Medicaid now if you got uh, 23,000 23, income a year. It's going to go up a little bit. That will move that up. And 
almost all of this Medicaid increase is covered by federal money. The states pay a variable percentage of Medicaid now, but this is all going to come out of the federal budget, almost all coming out of the federal budget. And then there's insurance. We have a very odd insurance system in that insurance is almost entirely linked to employment. Why is that? Because you can deduct that off the cost of doing business. Um, that's unusual. Most people are on insurance, but it's less than half of the entire health care cost. Why is that? Who has a job? It's not those disabled people, and it's not the people over 65. So the government tends to cover the most expensive people, and the insurance tends to cover people who are relatively healthy. What ACA does is it decreases the cost of insurance by expanding the risk pool. So the whole idea behind the, sh the percentage of the people who will be covered by insurance in the future is that by expanding the pool, the risk to the insurance company actually decreases. The more people they have, the less likely one of those people is going to run up an enormous bill and bankrupt the insurance company. Insurance company like large pool. It subsidizes the insurance for low-income people, which is why this will occur. <clears throat> and then there's about 23 million people who will not be covered. ACA is not intended to cover that many people. There are peculiar carve-outs. Old Order Amish and Mennonites are not covered. The reason they're not covered is because they're participants in a health-sharing ministry. What they do is they basically cover their health care costs as a community. So it's an insurance scheme, but it's not external to the community. And then there's a donut hole here where people in a, in a middle to high income bracket who don't have insurance won't be, cover won't be subsidized and are excluded from the entire thing. So it's basically if you're, um, if the cost would be less than 8% of your, your, more than 8% of your income, you don't get covered by that. And then we don't cover undocumented illegal migrants, except, of course, we do. Uh, their health care cost is covered because their emergency care is covered. And what that means is not just the broken bone that brings them to my emergency department, but their follow-up orthopedic care is covered. To give you an example, and I, I have a bunch of friends who go, we shouldn't cover that. So what do you do when you have a seven-year-old girl who's hit by a pickup truck, which I had one of my last shifts? Obviously, you're going to treat her. You don't know whether she's insured or not insured. You don't know whether she's on Medicaid. You don't know anything about her. Well, once you've run up a $10,000 bill and her dad shows up and he turns out not to speak any English and doesn't have any ID, what are you going to do? Stop treating her? No. So the problem with this is that we cover the expensive care for undocumented and illegal migrants currently. This won't change that. There, that money has to come out of some pot. It turns out it comes out of your insurance bill. So the cost of this entire thing is going to be about $53 billion. That's about a 0.9% increase in Medicaid taxes if you make over 200000 a year quarter of a million if you're joint filing, and an increase of 3.8% in the unearned income tax over a quarter of a million a year. So if you have an unearned income over a quarter of a million a year, you will pay another 3.8%. Then there's a tax on high cost health insurance, the kind of stuff that covers absolutely everything. And that adds up to about half the total. Then there's a tax on medical devices and drugs which is another $11 billion. Um, oddly enough, the device manufacturers and the drug companies are not particularly offended by this because the quid pro quo for them is, the, is there's no pressure to reduce their costs. So they are still selling drugs fairly expensively. They have promised not to flee the country, so they supply jobs, um, and we're taxing them a bit more. And then there's a penalty tax, and the penalty tax 
is a maximum of about $700 a year or 2.5% of your income. So it's not much of a penalty, and no rational person would fail to pay that if they could weasel out of getting health insurance and knew they wouldn't get sick. And then the corporations have to pay a little bit higher percentage. They're about $5 billion. So the money is spread out over a fairly large pool. So who's in that $53 million? Um, it's not who you think it is. A quarter of those people are above the median income in the United States. And they don't have health insurance. So why? Some people can't get health insurance. I have a very good friend who's got very brittle diabetes. She's not going to quit her job because she'll never get health insurance again until ACA goes into effect. Pre-existing conditions basically lock you out if they're very expensive ones, if you've had cancer before. Some people are very high cost because they're either a very small pool. If you have a business with four employees, you're going to spend a lot more money on insurance than if you have a thousand employees. And if you're in a high risk pool, so one of my friends ran an auto shop, he had four employees, three mechanics and one clerk, his insurance bill was enormous because mechanics lose fingers, you know, things fall off the jacks. So he had both a very high risk pool and it was a small pool. He couldn't spread it over a lot of people. And then there's some people who really can't afford insurance. Um, they're not in that above median income bracket, but they're the people in the low end of the income scale generally who also have some reason why their insurance would be expensive. There are some people who can't. And then, of course, there are a lot of mixes in there. There are a lot of people who could afford insurance, but they might have to live in a tent um, up the canyon somewhere. Um, so the, it's, not, it's not clear. There are some people who damn well could afford insurance and choose not to get it. Um, they're called rational risk takers. And who's in that bracket? Well, if you're low risk, if you're a 24-year-old male, you're not going to get pregnant, you probably aren't going to need any expensive care. And if you want to see a primary care doc once a year, you pay cash. Why would you spend $5,000, $6,000, $8,000 a year for insurance if the chances you would end up needing it is one in a hundred, which is probably about the right number? The problem, of course, one problem is they often don't get any care at all. Mm, as a doctor, I think that's a bad idea. But guess what happens if um, they get cancer or they get hit by that pickup truck? They go bankrupt. They keep their house. They keep their car. They keep their clothes. They don't have any money in the bank, but if they're smart, they don't have any money in the bank anyway. And then they go on Medicaid. So are the, is it a rational risk? Yes, it's a rational risk. But they're also free riding on the rest of the system because what they're doing is they're saving $7,000 a year, putting it into something more fun, something reasonable. I'm not arguing with them. It's a smart thing to do. But we have to cover that. And we cover that mostly through the insurance premiums. It, your insurance premium is about $1,000 more than it would be if there was nobody uninsured. Now, why doesn't Medicaid cover that? Well, because Medicaid is designed to break even. You can't make money on your Medicaid patients. It has to come out of the insurance system. No other bucket of money exists. So one of the things ACA does is there's a mandatory package, and it's been very controversial. The idea behind this is that it eliminates those policies that discriminate or they exclude something that's reasonable. So you can't have an insurance policy that would cost $1,000 a year and would only cover accidents occurring on alternate Thursdays in months and with an ending with an R. That would basically not be an insurance policy. It would be basically the same as going without insurance. So if you're going to have a mandatory pa package, it has to be a reasonable coverage. Now, of course, the Catholic Church is incredibly upset by the fact that one of the things on this is birth control. 
what's particularly interesting is they're actually exempt. The church is exempt. It's only their businesses that aren't exempt. So their schools aren't exempt. Um, any for-profit for business they run is not exempt. And obstetrics coverage is one of the things that re is required. A lot of insurance policies don't cover obstetrics. But it seems reasonable on a mandatory package that obstetrics ought to be in there. What's really peculiar about this is there's no insurance coverage, no real insurance policies that cover a fairly robust package that doesn't cover birth control and abortion. Why? Because they save money. Getting pregnant's expensive. So they want you to take the bloody birth control pills and not get knocked up. And if you do get knocked up, the insurance company, which is completely amoral, I understand where the Pope's coming from, the insurance company would much rather have you get an abortion than have to raise a child, go through the pregnancy, the delivery, and then there's another person on the insurance policy. So, in fact, it, this gets people's hair on end, but it doesn't really make a significant difference. ACA also requires men and women to pay the same. It gets rid of the gender bias. Women pay more up to the age of menopause, after which they pay less. By the way, that's, that, occurred, that started occurring back in the 1300s. Um, and then there's insurance exchanges. So if you don't get it through your company, then you buy it on the market and you buy it through one of these exchanges. The states have to set this up, otherwise the federal government will do it, and there's a lot of latitude in how they do it, but it allows insurance companies to go to a central place and then people can kind of pick the insurance through those. Um, what's interesting is it's probably not going to save any money. If you listen to Obama, he says it'll save money. However, the countries that have an insurance exchange for example, Switzerland, which I'm pretty familiar with, it doesn't save any money at all. So it's probably not going to save much. Now, who's heard of the death panels? Well, there are two death panels. Uh, first death panel is there was going to, they were going to set up an institute to assist patients and other people to advance clinical effectiveness research. Now, the problem, one of the problems in the United States is we don't really know what care is cost effective. We don't have a good mechanism for setting that. So what do the insurance companies do? They use the same data that the, that the Brits use. It comes out of the British healthcare system. Um, I'm not going to go into how you determine what cost effectiveness is, but it is quite possible to put a dollar price on the cost of a specific treatment that results in a specific outcome on average. So ACA was going to fund the same thing in the, in the U.S. It was not going to have any power to decide what would be covered. They specifically split that out. So that's the first death panel. And the un other death panel is you're supposed to have end-of-life discussions. So every time you go to the hospital, who's been to the hospital recently? Did you have your end-of-life discussion? Now, you're supposed to. Um, the, the Joint Review Commission, which is a private, nonprofit organization, does all the hospital accreditation in the U.S., requires that you have a um, discussion of whether you want to be resuscitated or not if you die or what you want done. So that's already there. These are voluntary, but they're unfunded. So this is one of these mandates that, as a physician, I hate because I don't get paid to do it and ACA was going to fund these. They took that out of the final law. <clears throat> and then there's lots of et ceteras in ACA. ACA is 2,500 pages long. I have not read the whole thing. One of my good friends did, but he got paid to do that. Some of these turn out to have major impact on a small population. So, for example, there's dependent coverage available up to age 26. Currently, it's only available to 21, although most insurance companies have now moved to 26 already. So, for example, my son, who is currently bumming his way around the world, can stay on my policy this year. Next year, he goes to medical school, 
and um, will probably go on his own health care plan at that point. It also eliminates annual and lifetime limits. So many insurance policies have a limit per year and a limit per lifetime. So God forbid you should exceed that by getting cancer in January um, and then sometime in the end of the year you don't get your chemotherapy paid for anymore. Whereas if you were lucky enough to get your cancer in, say, oh, December, you could run up a big bill then and then another big bill the next year. So that's been eliminated. And that will affect some people, not a lot, but it'll make a huge difference to those people. And it also covers a lot of preventative care. One of the things is all vaccines that are, that are on the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention list, are covered by insurance. Turns out most insurance companies don't cover most vaccinations. So I got my Zoster vaccine uh, three weeks ago, covered by my insurance company. I love it. It also caps the amount of it that insurance companies can spend on non-medical expenses. Now, insurance companies immediately said, but advertising's a medical expense. And that was shot down by the administration. So it's capped at 15% for large insurance corporations and 25% for smaller corporations. That probably isn't going to make a huge difference because there's some other things that will probably reduce their overhead. Um, so that will probably get better. So let's look at Massachusetts because Romney, the previous Romney, not the current Romney, the previous Romney who is a liberal, not the current Romney who's not, um, passed this. Romney care is very, very much like Obamacare. They are both derivatives of a system put together by, by a conservative think tank back in the 50s. It's actually first proposed by Richard Nixon. One of the things that's in there is a penalty clause. The penalty is much higher in Massachusetts, $1,200, which is enough to hurt. But they often waive that if you have some good reason why you can't afford the insurance. The costs are within the estimates, but again, some of that is because the money came from the federal government. So the real cost is probably near the top of the estimate. Job growth has probably slowed a little bit. The best estimate the economists had come up with is about, about 18,000 jobs were lost due to this. But Massachusetts turns out to be the top state for job growth. So there are advantages in having mandatory insurance in that it makes that area more desirable for people to live in. And it also has advantages because people are more likely to continue working in those states. The costs per policy are high, but in fact, the costs per capita are low and stable. Massachusetts has always had very high insurance because people in Massachusetts like health care. They like going to the doctor. They like going to the hospital. The doctors like putting them in the hospital. Their the costs have always been high. It really has not moved it up. It has not had that big an effect on any financial, measurable financial status. Long-term effects, is it a tax increase? Absolutely, it's a tax increase. Most of that's on unearned income. Romney would pay $800,000 a year. I am not criticizing him, okay? If I could avoid paying taxes by moving my taxes somewhere else, I would have done it. There's no law that says you have to pay taxes that you don't owe. I think he did the right thing, but it's on unearned income. The effect on people with earned income is going to be very small. And like I said, most of the rest is coming from medical devices and drug manufacturers who will be selling more of those, and that's probably pretty close to cost neutral. Is it a job killer? That's very complicated. The insurance companies are going to lay off a lot of people. No question about it, because they have no motive to have people on staff whose job it is to say, that was a pre-existing condition, we're not paying for it. Or saying, you've exceeded your limit for this year and not paying for it. So a lot of their overhead is simply going to go away. Those jobs are going to vanish. Um, Companies that don't offer insurance are going to have to pay more money. 
And that's going to be very complex. Right now, think about it. You've got two stores on the end of the street. Store A pays for health insurance. Store B does not. So who's got the most profit? Store B, right? But Store A is paying for Store B's health care. Their employees have no health care, but that extra $1,000 that Store A employees have to pay is going to subsidize their competition. So there is a cross-subsidy that occurs right now that will be much smaller in the future. It really levels the playing field. It, it reduces the motivation to not cover insurance. That's both good and bad, and I'll tell you why I think it's both good and bad a little bit later. And most companies that don't cover health insurance are not going to quit. They're not going to lay off people. They are going to continue to have employees because they can't move. If you could move to India, you probably have already moved to India. But if you can't move to India because you're selling groceries, this is not going to have a huge effect. Some companies are going to get hit. Um, there's a subsidy up to 25 employees. That subsidy is cut off. At 50 employees, you've got to get insurance and there's no subsidy. So some companies are going to get to 48, 49 employees and they're going to stop growing. That's not good for the economy. Not a huge number, but that will happen. One of the big things is this will increase the portability of health insurance. Right now, my friend with a bad diabetes can't leave. So if she gets a better job at another company, which would be good, an economist would say she should take it. The other company thinks she's worth more money, she'll be more productive, somebody else can take her old job, etc. But she can't leave. She's basically trapped in that job unless her insurance becomes portable. And ACA will make insurance far more portable because you'll be able to carry your insurance from company to company because they can't deny it on the basis of your chronic diabetes. So from an economic standpoint, the portability is a big deal. Germany has very portable health insurance, um, which is run through the Bismarck system, which is basically um, very similar to the insurance scheme we use, except they don't have a for-profit. And in fact, employees in Germany are much more mobile. It's thought to be one of the reasons why they're more productive. Young people, some will win if they can stay on a policy, some will lose because they're cheap. If you're 22, you're not going to run up a really big bill. So some people will end up paying more for their insurance. That's pretty much exclusively people under the age of about 40 who have an individual policy, not one through a business. Okay, so let's put it in perspective. That's in billions of dollars, which I have trouble putting in perspective. The additional cost of the ACA is about $53 billion. There will be some decrease in cross-subsidies. If I tell people that you will have to pay an extra $1,000 in taxes, they go crazy. But if I say, but you'll pay $1,000 less in health insurance, they go, that's a wash. It's not quite a wash. Um, but there is a significant decrease in the insurance costs that will occur over time. Federal budget is uh, quite a bit bigger than that. Social Security is quite a bit bigger than that. Department of Defense is uh, 15 times that. And that excludes the Veterans Administration and Homeland Security. I'm not quite sure what Homeland Security does sometimes, but anyway. Um, and government health care right now is almost a trillion dollars. So this will add about 5% to it. <clears throat> so there's our summary. Little effect on the on most people. If you have insurance, your insurance is going to drop a little bit. Your tax may go up a little bit, but probably won't. You know, it's it's going to be pretty close to a wash. If you're uninsured and you're not illegal, um, it's going to be a big deal those few people in there, it's going to be a big deal. And it's going to be mostly a big deal because they will be able to get primary care. They will get more health care. It will cost more money. As a doctor, I think that's okay, but that's the reality. 
Um, some of it will be wasted, but some of it will not. There's also a moral hazard, and insurance is per se a moral hazard. I quote this, quoted this right out of The Economist. The problem is if you're insured, you're not as careful. So if you're uninsured, you're going to be a little more careful driving your car. Not a lot more careful. Well, people who have auto anti-lock brakes drive a little tiny bit faster on average. It's documentable. The difference turns out to make up for your anti-lock brakes. Anti-lock brakes don't make you safer because you drive a little bit faster. So there is a moral hazard. On top of that, poor health choices are economically desirable. The reason for that is that we spend most of our money in old age, most of our health care money in old age, Social Security in old age. The economists say that the perfect disease is a fatal allergy to gold watches. So when you get a gold watch on your retirement party, you drop dead. Um, you don't collect Social Security. You don't collect Medicare. Um, your productive life is over, and so is your economic life. So this will make a difference. And in fact, health care in general doesn't save money. There are exceptions to the rule, but overall it doesn't. So let's talk about the exceptional USA. Well, we have a Bismarck plan like most of Europe. That's where your insurance is through your employer. But we link it very tightly to the employer because of that pre-existing complaint problem. And it's for-profit insurance. Bismarck, back in 1870-something, put this in in Germany. It's now, the same, now Denmark has it, Switzerland has it. Most of the Scandinavian countries do something similar. Um, it, their insurance schemes, the one big difference is their insurance is all nonprofit. The things in the ACA are going to make that less of a difference. Insurance companies don't make a huge profit. They make a lot of money, but that's because there's a huge amount of money going through them. Their percentage profit is not that high, and their percentage profit will drop under ACA because their risk will become more homogeneous. We also have a single-payer system like Canada. That's Medicare and Medicaid. That's not socialized. As a physician, I get paid when I see a Medicare or Medicaid patient. I'm not employed by the government. It's a single-payer system. And we have a socialized system, the VA system, IHS, where the physicians and the nurses and the clerks are actually employed by the government. But we spend about twice as much as most people do. We spend about twice as much as Canada does. We spend about twice as much as Germany, not quite twice as much as Germany does. Although Germany covers spa care. So... <laughs> I'm not complaining. I could use it. Um, we have enormous overhead. A lot of that is for overhead. But the other thing is we happen to really like health care. Germans don't like health care. Germans don't like being sick. They don't like hospitals. They do not want to go to the sick house. And we're going to get into why that's a big problem. Now, in the short term, what's going to happen? Well, not a lot. A lot of it won't, get, won't kick in for two years. Probably half the states are going to refuse the expansion on Medicaid. So that expansion is only going to be half as great as we thought. What will happen in the long run? They'll all accept it. No state successfully refuses federal money. Uh, <laughs> Medicaid originally, w half the states refused Medicaid when it originally came out. They all have it now. So that's just not going to happen. There'll be a lot of attempts to repeal. Nothing's going to happen until after November. What's really peculiar from a political standpoint is ACA is an albatross around the Democrats' neck. Almost all Americans think it's terrible. Every single part of ACA has a popularity rating near 80%. So that Republicans are stuck attacking something that every single piece people like, and the Democrats are stuck with something that overall nobody likes. So what are the options? Well, there isn't really terribly good options in the long run. If we want to have a health care system that's a little more rational than our current one, we've got to tweak it a little bit. This is only tweaking. One of the accusations, government's inefficient. Well, here's the, here's the fact. Medicare overhead is less than 1.3%. 
It's really higher than that because there is some overhead that's covered by other government agencies. But Medicare actually does police for fraud. Insurance companies generally don't. They let, Medi they let Medicare police for fraud. And then they, which is reasonable, they're much bigger. Um, and then the insurance companies generally go off that. They will check the bill against what was done, but they generally don't send anybody out to the hospital to see if, the, if things actually occurred as the bill looked like. The real overhead on Medicare is probably about 6%, maybe a little bit, probably a little bit less than that. Most insurance companies are in the 10 to 15% range. Notice ACA caps that. Notice it's not going to make any real difference. But their overhead will go down a wee bit. Administrative costs, this is, this is incredible. Our administrative cost is almost a third of our entire health care budget. You're not paying for health care with that. You're paying for the 27% of all U.S. health care workers who are administrators and clerks. Administrative cost is much higher here than anywhere else on the planet. Uh, Canada is about 17%. Germany is a little bit lower than that. Um, Switzerland is about the same. Most total administrative costs are running, running about 15, 10 to 15% internationally. Does ACA, oh, this is great. This is great. Remember the accusation that it, uh, ACA was taken out of your Medicare, so all you old people should vote against it? That turns out to be what is known as uh, incorrect. Um, <laughs> It does reduce growth by $70 billion a year, which is basically enough to cover. But nothing's new about that. We, every president, every Congress looks at Medicare and Medicaid, and they go, where are the inefficiencies? Fix them. So Reagan did it. George, George Bush the first did it. And Clinton did exactly the same kind of thing. And Ryan's budget does the same thing. He cut $70 billion out of Medicare. Now, where is it coming out of? By the way, the current, the current Republican um, platform says they're going to put it back in. That's not going to happen. They will take it out. They're not dumb. Um, it, there's a thing called Medicare Advantage, which is Medicare run by private insurance companies. It turns out to be very inefficient. It costs more than the government program does. Guess what? They have more overhead. So that has just been cut. Um, the haircut is that they can't exceed the cost of the government program, the reality is all the insurance companies are going to drop it. And then there's cuts in payments for hospital that meet these patient care benchmarks, some of which are reasonable, some of which are not very reasonable, but this is the wave of the future, and the last four presidents have all pushed this in-hospital efficiency thing. Malpractice. The other question I got when I gave this talk before is, how, what will eliminating malpractice do? And the answer is almost nothing acutely. Direct cost of malpractice is only about 3%. The problem is 80% of that doesn't go to anybody, any patients. It goes to attorneys. It goes to, um, to doctors being expert witnesses. It goes to insurance companies. It goes, it goes, it goes. One of the reasons is that doctors win almost all the lawsuits. They win about 80% of them. Well, that's just overhead. No p patient's probably injured, but it wasn't malpractice, so they're not going to get anything out of that. But the indirect costs are high, and this next slide is what's really wrong with American health care. We got an accelerator. We don't got a break. We love health care. Americans love tests. They love high-tech stuff. Brits don't like being in the ICU. They want out of the ICU. Brits, well, I worked in Britain. I, I went to school there. I worked in Britain for a while. British guys have heart attacks. They want to go home. Americans have heart attacks. They want to go to the intensive care unit. Intensive care unit's a little better than going home, but it's not hugely better. And the fact is that it's a lot cheaper to go home. We just like it. And we don't pay for it. Nobody pays for their health care, right? So what would happen if I offered you food insurance? Every month, you'd have to pay a certain amount of money to my insurance company, and in return, you could buy all the food of any kind that you wanted. Filet mignon, Clicquot champagne. That's what people would be eating, right? 
That's what the healthcare system has done. And as a physician, I don't pay and my patients don't pay. So I'm prone to order more tests than are needed. I'm very conservative. I'm the, I'm the good guy, okay? But even I get more tests in the United States than I would in Britain. And my colleagues often get huge numbers of tests more. And I'll never get sued for that. I might get sued for not getting a test. How could we cut costs? Well, if we like it, that's a problem. And I will tell you right now that the biggest difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in health care is that the Democrats want the government to cap health care by putting screws to everybody below it, but not change what we're delivering. And the Republicans want to give people lots of choices, but you can't rationally pick an insurance policy because most of us can't even read it. You don't really know what's in it. So neither party is going to realistically cut the price of health care in this country. Could we cut overhead? Yeah, absolutely. We could save 10% tomorrow if we put in a Bismarck-based system like Europeans do. Could we cut the marginal care? Yeah, I actually do not want to spend the last week of my life in the intensive care unit. My, my mother-in-law, who's in her mid-90s, she says, I don't, I'm not worried about dying. I don't want to end up in that ward, the Alzheimer's post-bad stroke ward where you can't recognize family members. And some people are going to get hurt. It's really marginal costs. It's, it's the kid who, if he doesn't get a bone marrow transplant, is going to die. But there's a 99.9% 99 .9 chance he's going to die if he gets one. Should we do that? I don't know. Where is the cost benefit? Where would you draw the line? With our insurance system, he gets a bone marrow transplant. This is literally true. We dialyze patients who can't recognize family members. They made the mistake of not signing their living will. Please sign a living will, everybody. They didn't sign it. And so now they're getting dialysis and they can't say no because they have Alzheimer's or they've stroked out or whatever. And I watch people, my mother's nursing, my mother-in-law's nursing home, getting wheeled off for their dialysis while they're tied down to the bed. God forbid that should happen to me. And then there's this marginal, marginal benefit thing. The next test will give me a little bit more information, but it won't give me much. I can do pretty much all I do by examining somebody, and then a few x-rays and a few lab tests. But the next lab test might add a little bit, and the one after that might add a lot. Standard in an emergency department in the United States, if you have abdominal pain, the nurse will order roughly 30 tests. Not always very helpful. But Americans love it. Who's seen the scanner in the mall? <laughs> They've taken them out, by the way. We finally got them banned. But people were getting CT scans as a screening tool. Now, they cause cancer. That's a bad thing. But the real problem, though, is almost all of those scans are, are almost all of the positive scans are false positives. So I have a good friend who went to the mall, said, oh, I'll get a scan, see if there's anything wrong with me. Well, turns out he's got a gallstone and a spot on top of his kidney. Now, the guy's a commercial pilot. He can't fly with this if he has a gallstone attack. So does he want to have surgery for an asymptomatic gallstone, which will probably never cause a problem? I, I, I had to talk him out of it. But if he has an attack, then he can't fly. What's that spot on his kidney? Well, to get to it, you've got to stick a needle under fluoroscopy from here into the top of that thing, and it's probably a blood vessel, so it'll bleed a lot. And then you have to have, you know, an incision here to go with stuff you don't want to have done. It's probably benign. So his choices are get the needle or go back and get a CT scan in six months. Notice the second line up there about the um, cancer rate? Well, guess what he did? He got a CT scan. It shrunk a little bit. He got examined a couple times after that. It went away. He basically was terrified for about six months. And the answer is... Um, that he probably runs a significant risk of, of getting cancer. We also do, we're, we've got an ultrasound scanner 
A lot of people get their ultrasound scan. I do ultrasounds all the time. They're terribly inaccurate. Getting an ultrasound scan because you might, they might find something. They might find something. They might find something that's worth treating. Distinctly possible. It's happened to friends of mine. But the chances that they'll find something that isn't real is far greater. Question? Yeah, it, it, but we like them. What I'm saying is we like them. When you go to the emergency department with right lower quadrant abdominal pain, you probably have appendicitis, and you will probably get a CT scan. I'm done. Yes? Well, that, that's, first of all, there's the healthy American problem, okay? Insurance has nothing to do with whether, with the fact that you're healthy. Insurance has to do because you might get sick. So overall, it's somewhere between five and $8,000 a year. A year. A year. there with full coverage and I can't I can't understand why the difference is so great because <laughs> we have an accelerator no break you would get more health care in the United States than you would in the Czech Republic so but I guess there's fine health care there see <laughs> that's the problem you're correct but if you have I will bet that if you had mid-abdominal pain which moved down to your right lower quadrant and you had a low-grade fever and you didn't feel like eating and you were very tender when I pushed you in the right lower quadrant. In the Czech Republic, the surgeon would go, eh, we ought to take a look in there, you probably have appendicitis. And in the United States, they'd probably go, eh, we ought to take a look in there, you probably have appendicitis, let's see what the CT scan shows first. And there is a marginal benefit. That scan might show something completely different. I get CT scans on patients. I don't get a lot. I don't get as much as many of my colleagues do. I could cut the cost of health care in the United States by 50%, and almost nobody would notice the difference. But I couldn't cut it by much more than that without making a difference. Um, we all make a lot of money. Physicians in the United States make a lot of money. But they don't actually make a lot more than the British physicians do. Um, the big difference is a British physician gets paid to go to medical school. Czech Republic, ditto. You go, you go through medical school and you don't owe any money. Um, I talked to a medical student last month who owed a quarter of a million dollars mm. at the end of medical it's school. It's cheaper for me um, to go to the doctor and pay them than the Czech Republic. And, and my mom's a doctor here. My mom's a pediatrician. She spent her whole life treating <coughs> Medicare patients, and none of her four children have had medical insurance after they got out of college. Um, but I just, I like the difference between 1,500 versus 5,000 is huge for me. It's right huge. Now. Well, it's three times as much money. Um, there are other systems. Singapore, which actually has a system I love, Singapore taxes everybody the equivalent of about 2,000 US a year. That goes in a little bucket that has your name on it, only you can spend that money, and you can only spend it on health care. They also tax you about 2000 a year for another bucket, which goes to get your name on it, and it goes to buying a house, or in Singapore, it's a condo. Now here's the trick. They cover prenatal care vaccinations, basic primary care. They cover really expensive stuff. They have a package the government covers, so your cancer chemotherapy gets covered. But they don't cover anything up to $2,000 a year. You pay for that out of that bucket. Now what happens if you don't spend it? It rolls over into the second bucket. You get to keep it. So what happens is when you come to me, I go, I could get a CT scan, 
but that's coming out of your pocket. So they're everybody's motiv motivated to save the money. Um, right in the U.S., nobody's motivated to save the money. Why would the dialysis doctor not dialyze somebody with severe Alzheimer's? He gets paid to do it. He'll get sued if he doesn't. The HSA accounts and how Obamacare might affect them. The what? HSA health savings accounts. Oh, yeah. Um, health savings accounts are, are going to be much less of a big deal under this because almost everybody is going to get covered. Not quite everybody. Like I said, there's still packages of people who won't get covered. They, if you're in that bracket that you don't get subsidized and you don't qualify for Medicaid and um, you're over that income bracket, the H health savings accounts are brilliant. Those are the people who really benefit and they will not benefit significantly in the future. So that is going to be much less effective. That was a reasonably good idea. The problem we found is that if you get really sick, it goes away. And if you're not really sick, you'd rather have it in cash. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, um, currently in Colorado, um, we buy health insurance for our staff um, if their 24 hours are over, but under 24 hours, we, you know, we, can't, we, we can't offer them to be part of the pool. So how does this affect that? Will that will it change now? It's not clear. It, there is, again, a cap because you don't – somebody who's less than 50 percent could theoretically be working two full-time, two half-time jobs. They would end up in this second pool and would have to go to the insurance – yeah, the, 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 the state cooperative to purchase it on their own. Since there's uh, two point, I think somewhere between 2.4 and 2.6 trillion dollars in uh, Social Security and Medicare, and it'll last until uh, 2064. Uh, they <coughs> keep saying it's empty. That's why I know that, according to Tom Hartman. And uh, uh, so what's what's his plan? And what, hey, where, where do you, does it uh, they, stack up? Well, Ryan, again, the Republicans are trying to do this from the bottom up. They're trying to give individual patients maximal, maximal control over the, both their money and their health care. The problem with health care is you can't predict what's going to happen. So you get the cheap insurance and something really bad happens and you're in bad trouble. Um, there is a major concern that health care is gradually expanding to take over all our dollars. And to some degree it is. So I agree, I totally agree with the idea that you should decrease, we should try to decrease the amount of money we spent. Um, the way it's, way Ryan actually wanted to set it up is so that Medicare would be what is functionally a voucher system. You get a certain amount of money, you buy insurance with it. It would have big advantages. The disadvantage is it would be capped and it would eventually not cover your full insurance. It also would not cover completely if you're in a higher income bracket. So you'd have to spend more money. Um, I don't think that's that unreasonable. Bracket doesn't have to pay anything. Well, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the problem is neither party really has a long term solution to this because neither party has anything that's likely to reduce the overall cost of health care. And if you don't reduce the overall cost of health care, it's going to keep going up, particularly because we're getting older and old people spend all their money. You put money in to your health insurance for 40 years and then you take it out over the next 20. So I'm not convinced that either party has a very good solution. This is actually a very conservative solution. The Heritage Foundation actually wrote most of the parts of what has now become Obamacare. Um, 
I think this is a step in the right direction, but it's not a big step in the right direction. I think that I think the idea that the Republicans have is is a very good idea. The idea is that individuals would have a little bit of skin in the game. I think the way they've laid it out is going to hurt some people pretty badly. And I don't like that. I had, I'm an emergency physician. I've always treated everybody who comes in. I ne have never asked for money. Um, that's my profession. I understand that if nobody can pay, I go broke. Um, Money coming, you got feds, uh, and they're they're spread out through all of the you know, hospitals. In yeah, Florida. but I, but my income it was pretty even at the university. My income was pretty much dependent on what I could actually get paid by patients. Well, they're, they're spread out for people That's who can't. Right, right. Any other question? It doesn't make a big difference. It's not a big deal. It's 53 million out of a. It's five percent, not counting any cross transfers, which will decrease it. So, as someone who turned 26 in 2014, when the state exchanges were going to be set up, is this going to help me? <laughs> yeah, but it won't help you a lot. It will help you, and it won't. In the long run. This will drive insurance costs down by expanding the pool, by eliminating their overhead to get rid of people who are chronically ill or something. Overall, insurance costs will go down a little bit, but not by much. Um, it's not going to make a huge, the, the bad news is it won't make a huge difference. Your insurance is going to be really high, just like my insurance is really high. I kept it when I retired from the university, and I'm still paying a chunk of money for it. On the other hand, if I get cancer, I'm covered. Any other questions? We'll